I'm excited to be here today with our good friend, Philip Yancey. Philip has explored the most basic questions and deepest mysteries of the Christian faith, <clears throat> taking millions of readers with him. Early on, he crafted best-selling books such as Disappointment with God and Where is God When It Hurts, while also editing The Student Bible. He co-authored the three books with the renowned surgeon, Dr. Paul Brand. More recently, he felt the freedom to explore central issues of the Christian faith, penning award-winning titles such as The Jesus I Never Knew, What's So Amazing About Grace, and Prayer Doesn't Make Any Difference. His books have garnered 13 gold medallion awards from Christian publishers and booksellers. He currently has more than 15 million books in print published in over 50 languages worldwide. His latest book, Where the Light Fell, is his first memoir, and it released earlier this week. And also, we have not announced this yet, but Philip and I are going to be working on a writer's conference in Colorado this coming June. So I'm very excited about that. So, Philip, thanks so much for all your work and for being here with us today. Oh, uh, wouldn't miss it, Brian. You're the greatest at book launches. Oh, uh, well, I just enjoy, you know, speaking with authors about their new work. It's just exciting for them and it's exciting for me. And uh, I mean, in your case, I, I know we've talked about this before. I don't know of any other authors, American authors. Christian authors, at least, who have been as widely distributed in, in Asia and other countries as you have been. You know, I spent a lot of time over mm. there in various trips. And, uh, you know, your name was the one that was the most prominent of any of the people who, you know, we would associate with, associate with, with Christian mm. books here in the United States. Well, my wife was a missionary kid. She grew up in Colombia and Peru. And she tried very hard to get me out of the United States as soon as she could. And we have, we've made that a priority. I love going to these countries where, like in Japan, maybe one or 2% of the population is Christian. And, and they need a boost. They need some outside encouragement. And just visiting over there and then making books available for them, it's, it's, it feeds my soul, too. And I, I see the church in these other countries at different stages, you know, in the United States, yeah. it's kind of like a big corporation, <laughs> operates like a corporation. But in some of these countries, they're much closer to the circumstances in which the gospel first spread, you know, back in Jesus day and Paul's day, where they're hearing the words for the first time and taking them seriously and really standing out from the culture around them. So I benefit more than they do. I always felt that myself. I just learned so much and had such a broader appreciation of the world than, you know, just sitting in my home. So, uh, yeah, you know, I think that that's what you've done has really blessed those countries, but also, as you said, uh, been a blessing to you. So, yeah. And some of these writers, you know, people in the U S that you deal with are, are concerned about falling sales and all that. But I, I was in a, a writer's group in Bulgaria. There were 60 people there. Bul Bulgaria only has, I think, about 8 million people. And there's no way you can make a living <laughs> writing for, for a tiny slice of that 8 million. You know, sure. they, they have a small Christian market even in the country. And yet these people are, are energized and inspired and, and they are producing material because they they have it in their souls. They want to get it out and they want to share it with others. It's, it's, it's really uh, an impressive thing to see in a country like that. Yeah, it is. That, that's, that's a great perspective for us all to think about. Yeah. <laughs> so, well, we can still uh, complain about lack of sales here, right? <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I can imagine because it's, it's their language, right? So it's limited. Sure. That country, yeah. you know, that's right. You got to speak Bulgarian. <laughs> yeah. It's like, that's not a huge market. <laughs> right. So, you know, you and I have talked about your, your book, you know, it's the first memoir that you've written yes. and it took you a long time to write yeah. it, right? And, and it yeah. had to be a tough thing to do. I mean, can you talk a little bit about, you know, how that all played out? Sure. Yeah, it took me 71 years to write it, by, <laughs> <laughs> which is how old I am. But um, I first got the idea, I was at a writer's conference, very small writer's conference, only about 10 of us back in the days when Catherine Marshall was there and John and Elizabeth Sherrill, who wrote The Hiding Place and, and uh, Crossing the Switchblade, they invited a small group of young writers. I was in my 20s at the time. And I was kind of intimidated in this group. These were people I'd heard of. And we were just sitting at a, at a dinner table conversation. John Sherrill turned to me and said, uh, tell me your story. 
And I had never been asked that question before. So <laughs> I just started telling him facts from my childhood. And suddenly he started, he started choking. And I thought he must have swallowed some food down the wrong pipe, you know, and didn't know if I should be pounding on his back or giving him the Heimlich maneuver or something. And then I realized he was he was choking with sobs. Wow. And he was he was just so moved by what I told him about my story. And when it's your story and you're a kid, you grow up, you, you just kind of think this is the way life is. This is normal. I mean, you know, it's different than other people's families, but it doesn't seem something worth writing about. And for the first time, I kind of stepped back and saw, wow, I was given an unusual set of criteria to begin my life, yes. and my career. And over the years, I read a lot of memoirs. I took a lot of notes, interviewed people in my family and, and just made it a, a long study. I knew there were going to be some people in the family who would be deeply hurt by the things that I wrote. So I kept putting it off, putting it off, putting it off. And, and finally, I decided now's the time. Well, it actually came to a head when I had that rollover accident back in 2007. I was lying there and the doctor said, if your carotid artery has been penetrated by a bone fragment, you, you'll be dying in a few minutes here. Uh -huh. And I thought, wow, you know, what, what would I miss having done? And the first thing that came to my mind is I got to write that memoir. And I really wow. started taking it seriously after that, reading other people, trying to figure out how memoirs work. And then uh, finally, I spent pretty much three years, three full years. I, I didn't know how to write a memoir. And I, I just wrote down everything I could remember. And it was 240,000 words, which would be <laughs> 800 pages. Nobody wants to read that. <laughs> so I got it down to 99. <laughs> so, I, you know, I cut a lot out. But uh, it really traces back to that first time when I, I told my story, when I didn't realize I had a story. We all do. And some are more dramatic than others. I didn't realize mine was dramatic. But then the more I told it to people, the more I realized it was unusual. This was the gift, as it were, the gift that I was given as a writer. And I need to treat it with the kind of stewardship of every gift that we're given. Well, you know, I can honestly say to me, it felt like reading a novel. You know, I mean, I, I was in, enthralled by it. I couldn't put it down. You know, I just have to keep, you know, going to the next chapter to hear what the next phase of the story was going to be, because it was just like, oh my goodness, I never knew all this stuff about, you know, your background. So, yeah. Uh, and I'm kind of glad that I, I waited, you know, I, I've gone through kind of the basics of the faith over the years, two dozen books and, um, Really, when I wrote this, I, I realized that I had written a prequel, a backstory that explains why I'm so obsessed with things like suffering and with grace. Didn't really know that until I wrote this memoir. And I, I tried certain things. I, I don't know how successful they are, but one of the things I tried was, I, I've read a lot of memoirs and I don't like, personally, I don't like memoirs of this old man looking back on life. You know? <laughs> I like ones that are more immediate that kind of grab me at each stage. Of oh, yeah, it so felt wanted, like you were there. You know, well, I wanted to express time. that. Yeah, the child's point of view and then the yeah. sultry teenager's point of view and then the radical college student in the 60s point of view and then the <laughs> walked up the side of the head by a conversion experience point of view. And, you know, I, I wanted to capture that. And so I tried something that was pretty risky. I, I wrote the whole thing. Uh, in present tense, as if it's happening, you know, when I'm in the sixth grade, I'm writing about, I'm writing in the present tense. I, I go to school instead of I went to school. And I, I hope that worked. And I, I guess I wanted to express the, the stage I was in with the, with the consciousness of the kind of stage I was in at the time. Like I said, it really comes across that way. You know, it's, it's like a story, you know, uh, um, a novel kind of a thing mm. and, 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 you know, kind of like, you know, draws you in and you keep wanting to go to the next chapter to see what, you know, what happens next. Well, I had a lot to learn. Um, <laughs> the first, the first draft, even though it was long, it was pretty boring because I was just getting the facts down and I had some wise editors and, and they kept saying, go back, put a motion in it. Tell me what you were feeling, what was going on inside you. Mm. And then whenever possible, use dialogue. So 
I mean, Frederick Buechner, who he used to work for, uh, was a master of that. You really can't tell much difference between his nonfiction and his fiction. You know, <laughs> he's using the techniques of fiction normally we expect in fiction, but you can use those to great advantage in nonfiction. <laughs> so this is nonfiction in a way, but but you're right, a memoir is kind of like a novel, and the the same thing. Same way in, in fiction these days, modern fiction, it plays around with flashbacks and time warps and things like that. In fact, there aren't very many just straight told from beginning to end stories anymore. We've got different characters' point of view. That's part of modern writing. So I've got a little of that in there as well, because uh, even though I wanted to capture the consciousness at the moment, some of the key events in my life were when I was one year old and I, I didn't really have a consciousness at that time that I can remember. So those kind of techniques you have to use. One of the most helpful books to me was a book called The Art of Writing Memoir. And I think, it, I think it's by Sven Burkertz. Hmm. Burkertz, I, I believe he teaches at Yale, B-I-R-K-E-R-T-S. And that was most helpful to me because if you just sit down and write your story, it can be flat, it can be boring. And you do really have to think through the structure and, and, and the rules, as it were, the rules that make a good memoir compared to a bad memoir or a boring one. <laughs> <laughs> so you mentioned Frederick Buechner. And I mean, I, you know, I've been read all of his works too. You know, there's so many parallels, yeah. right? You know, um, tragic things that happened when you were young. Um, yeah. relationship with a mother and a brother right um things that you know you both were reluctant to say until later in life yeah you know, do you draw some of those same parallels too yeah i i knew fred we've spent some time together and you're right all the things you mentioned are things that we have in common on the other hand i grew up in this narrow fundamentalist cultic type church, living in a, a trailer, <laughs> eight feet wide, 48 feet long on church property. Whereas Fred had homes in various places and, yeah. and was kind of in the, in the uh, New England elite uh, uh, and then at a, at a teaching at a, an elite boarding school for, for teenagers. And uh, in, in some ways we, we came to a similar place but from very different starting points. Um, and it's interesting, you, you're right. I mean, my, my father's death, his father's death, some of these things are formative for us. And, and how, no matter where you come from, whether you're raised, raised in poverty or a different ethnic group or whatever, you're gonna run into these, these barricades in the road. And the person you are is largely formed by how you respond to the barricades. Are you able to jump over them or, or do you run into them and just crash as my brother did in many ways? So uh, yeah, we had some things in common and, and some things very different, really? but, but in most cases it was, it was personal. I waited a, a long time, longer than Fred. Uh, I remember having a conversation with him where he said, here's my, the most, important event of my childhood was my father's death by suicide. And yet I was traumatized. I couldn't write about it because of fear, and threats from the family and things like that. And, and it was a breakthrough. And finally he said, well, I've, I've got to do that. I've got to face into it because it formed who I am. I mean, it, those books specifically of his were breakthrough books, right? You know, in a lot of right. different ways at, at the time yeah. that he wrote them, both for himself and I think for, you know, the market in general. But but having him do, do that influenced all his other writing too, significantly. Sure, sure. So it's just yeah. it was interesting that that played out the way that it did. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Of course, a major difference. I'm sure you know the probably the exact number, but at one point he had almost exactly the same number of nonfiction books as fiction books. He would just go back and forth, back and forth. He wrote a ton of novels. Yeah, he did, and. I did not. I've never written anything in fiction. I, I often write in story form as illustrations in the books that I write, but mine are all idea-driven books. I call them personal pilgrimage books, which aren't all that different than some of Fred's personal pilgrimage books, where he's mm -hmm. talking about yeah. his evolving faith Absolutely. and where, where it's going. But then he has that, uh, that great bank of experience as a, 
as a novelist to, to draw from. And I was kind of starting from scratch. I'm a pretty old guy to be started from scratch with a whole new genre. <laughs> but, uh, you know, I, I had a story and I had to tell it. Well, now you need to go do a novel next. Well, I don't know about that. <laughs> I, I took a course in uh, fiction writing at the University of Chicago hmm. and learned a lot. Mainly, I learned that when my when my stories really sang, they sounded like like essays, which is not a good fiction thing. <laughs> so, so that's where the, the kind of momentum picked up. And that's bad fiction. So just stick with the essays, Philip. And I've done <laughs> that until now. So, Well, you started as a journalist, and he started focused on novels. That's what he had really wanted right. to do, right? So right. much different literary starting points, you know, and yeah, that's got to be part of the reason why that's stayed that way. <laughs> yeah. So I'd like to read a couple of the blurbs for the book, because I just found them to be really great. One of was from Anne Lamott. She says, Philip Yancey is not just one of my favorite Christian writers, but one of my favorite writers, period. He's fearless in addressing the toughest questions in the hardest times, the crucifixions we will all know during this life, the hope and shapes and colors of the resurrection. That was really something. And then this one comes from Publishers Weekly. A gripping memoir. Yancey's eloquent descriptions of coming to faith and his exacting self-examination make this a standout. Exploring the corrosive role of fear and faith, Yancey's piercing and painful account invites comparison to Hillbilly Elegy. Mm -hmm. So did you ever think that you'd write a book that was compared to Hillbilly Elegy? <laughs> Uh, no. And the other <laughs> the other comparison that I've gotten in several reviews is Terror Westover's Educated, hmm. which may be closer. I mean, Hillbilly Elegy covers some of the South and Appalachia and some of that where I grew up. Uh, Terror Westover's book is much more about a almost cultic, in her case, Mormon fundamentalism. And uh, so the two together are recent memoirs that have attracted a lot of attention. And um, no, I, I have I would not have thought of making a comparison, especially now. JD Vance is headed into politics. He's running for yes. what governor of Ohio, I think it is, or it sounds right, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, so I'm not doing that, don't worry. <laughs> well that I mean <laughs> I wouldn't advocate that. So <laughs> okay. Um so one of your chapters starts with my earliest memories all involve fear. Yeah. So and I know other people that I'm close to, you know, have, that's what they most remember, you know, mm. from their early days was something bad that yeah. happened. I mean, what, what do you think that that tells us about human nature or why, what do you yeah. think that happens? I was out with a friend uh, yesterday and while we were talking, suddenly his phone rang and his wife was on the, was on the phone and she was crying and their daughter, who's an adult, uh, was in a traffic accident and she was uh, she keeps children for, for a living you know she's a babysitter and she had one of the neighbor's children with her in the car unfortunately the child was not hurt the daughter the driver was hurt pretty badly but the, they were in the proper seat belt and the child was not hurt and I started thinking this is searing deeply into that three-year-old's memory she may not be able to remember any visuals connected with it, but just that, that fear, the scariness, the noise, the aftermath, people huddling around here. Are you okay? Are you okay? And that's going to be a formative experience. And one of the things I learned about memoirs, because I read a whole bunch of them trying to figure out how they work, is that their, their real secret is not what they tell you about the writer. It's what they tell you about you, the reader. <laughs> mm, mm. And one reason I, I kept reading these memoirs is because I read some really lousy memoirs. I read some great ones. But every time, every time I read one, it summoned up a memory that I would not have been able to retrieve apart from reading that memoir. Wow. You know, they're there in our brain somewhere, but they, they have to be recalled and something mm -hmm. will, will mm -hmm. trigger a spark. Yeah. And so... Uh, when I write, you know, people say, well, why do you write about the church in negative ways? And, and I write about a, a narrow fundamentalist Southern church that's racist and all that. Not everybody has that experience, but I'll hear from people 
say, who went to Catholic schools and the nuns wrapped their fingers with rulers and, and uh, you know, maybe a Seventh-day Adventist who was punished for drinking Coke or something like that, you know, and um, their, their experience is not the same as mine. Nobody's experience is the same as mine. It's only mine. And yet, if I write about it with, with real specificity, then it's more likely to trigger those memories that make the person think, this is about me. I've got to, I've got to face how I would have handled this or how I did handle this. And it becomes almost a dialogue between the writer and the reader. I mean, it, you don't need to learn the facts of my life. So what, you know? <laughs> But if I can be a, a channel through the particular to speak to the universal, that's the key. I Isn't think. that amazing how that works? Yeah, really. Very true. Yeah. Huh. And it's, uh, I mean, you don't have to look any further than the Bible. It's like, <laughs> why did God start with one person, Abraham, you know? And why did God care so much about Israel? I mean, God understood that you get you got to start with a small and the particular <laughs> and then at some point you can just spread it out and invite in the universal which is the story of of the gospel truly so on a little bit lighter note i know when you were young you spent time at the jersey shore near where i live yeah can you share a little bit about those memories yeah in fact there's one that did not make it into print uh, we're a kid from the south we're kids from the South. I, my brother's two years older than I am. And uh, some kind people from this church in Philadelphia would let us sometimes stay free in, in a cabin they had in Ocean City. My mother would go there. It was a safe place because they didn't serve alcohol. <laughs> and it, there was a Christian conference center. and We would go to church, but we'd also get to ride the bikes on the boardwalk and go swimming and all that. And, and one story, uh, our hair was getting kind of long. So my mother just pulled off into this barber shop. And again, this didn't even make it into the book. I finally cut it out and it was hard to do, but the editor said, you just gotta trim. And she just chose this barber shop, had a barber pole. So she knew, and we walked in and there were eight men sitting around in these chairs. And so she, and, and one barber in his white, you know, bib. And uh, she said, oh, you must be very busy. And he said, no, 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 you're, you're next, you're next. So, she said, tells me to get up in the barber chair. And this guy starts hurting me. I mean, he's got these clippers and he's gouging me. And I'm going, ow, kind of mother yells at me, behave yourself, you know? And I reach up and there's blood on my head, at least, at least four different places. And while he's torturing me like that, the door opens and these policemen come in with their guns drawn. <laughs> and it, it says, nobody move. And it turns out that this is not a barbershop. It's a bookie joint. And everybody knows you don't go there to get your hair cut. You go there to bet on the horses, you know. But uh, we didn't know that. We thought it was a legitimate barbershop. So then my mother has to explain how we had a car with a Georgia license plate. You know, how, how did we end up at this bookie joint at this particular time? <laughs> she finally talked her way out of it. But uh, Oh, my goodness. Well, those you, are the you... memories. You're showing the shadow side of New Jersey there too. You yeah, know? right. We used to hear stories about pizza places too, but you know. Hopefully. Well, now it's all legal, right? The government runs it. So. <laughs> <laughs> oh my goodness. Anyway, <laughs> so one kind of coincidental part of your book, you mentioned that your brother met Francis Schaefer and had yes. like this brief conversation with him. And just right. recently, I recorded another book launch interview with Frank Schaefer, Francis's son. Right. about his new book and learn, you know, kind of about his dramatic change from the form of Christianity that he followed when he was young, you know, working closely with his father to where right. he's at now. Yeah. So, you know, do you kind of resonate with that story of that? Well, Francis Schaefer visited Wheaton in about uh, 1968, 1969. And I used to have the original typescript of the messages he gave. It was called mm. Speaking Historic Christianity into the 20th Century, mm. which later became a couple of his books, uh, Escape from Reason, I forget the names. And he was a radical at the time. He shows up, he's wearing knickers and a little cap, you know, dressed like a Swiss mountain hiker. <laughs> and uh, 
had a beard and he talked about modern culture. He talked about Camus and Sartre and, hmm. and the movies of Fellini and Bergman. Wow. And at Wheaton in those days, you, movies were against the code. You couldn't even go to a movie. So it kind of blew the kids away. You know, wow, he's talking about movies. We can't even see these movies. And um, later he, he got, he got tied into some of the political things, especially right. with C. Everett Coop and, and the abortion issue and, and life issues, which were important issues. But then they got kind of merged into the whole tilt toward the moral majority mm -hmm. and you know, right wing, yeah, right wing politics. <clears throat> and um, for a while there, Frank Schaefer was, was part of that. Yeah. He helped make the films and, uh, I, I attended several conferences where he was up there as an old line fundamentalist, you know, really arguing. <laughs> and then he went on a very different track. But uh, Francis was never narrow in attitude. Hmm. He, he ran this place, retreat center in Libri, Switzerland, and, and skeptics and agnostics would show up. And he would always treat them with grace and, and mercy. And... Uh, hospitality, generosity. Now I know Frank later had some stories that poked some holes in that, but I've talked to many people who went to Labrie and were deeply affected and changed by it. Mm. And in those days, Francis was not seen as mm. narrow or boxed in in some way. He was, he was very open and, and really a, a true radical in his own way. Interesting. Isn't it just kind of bizarre how we all change in different ways, you know, from different stages of our lives. Yeah, it is. And, and actually the whole, especially the evangelical movement has changed a lot. I mentioned in the book that uh, when I was growing up, we didn't talk about politics at all. We just assumed that we were kind of, we're, we were here to get ready for the next world. We didn't care much about this world, you know, we're just waiting to die so we can go to heaven. And, and whatever you have to do to get to heaven, that's, that's what was concerned. And so I didn't hear stories. I didn't hear sermons about justice and certainly not about race and some of these issues that are very important now. And we just had this, this single-minded focus. And then that started to change. John F. Kennedy ran for president. Well, he's a Catholic. And, and everybody in my church got a copy of If America Elects a Catholic President, this mm. scary... Yeah. diatribe about the Pope's going to run our foreign yeah. policy and stuff like that. And <clears throat> frankly, Brian, one of the things that, that uh, distresses me about the evangelical movement of which I've been a part is that it, it is often fear-based. They've always got to have something to fear, whether it's communism, which is a legitimate fear back in the Cold War, or Y2K, <laughs> right, or AIDS, right. or secular humanism. And, and now somehow it got into vaccines and masking. I don't know how that happened, but uh, it's, it, that's not a healthy thing. Um, James talks about perfect love casts out fear. And if we're defined by, characterized by fearfulness, then we're not, we're not really trusting God's perfect love. We should be known as people who are more confident and, and trusting. I've got some friends who are survivalists and they're spending so much energy packing away food and supplies in case the world ends. Well, the world is going to end probably, but <laughs> I don't think it's going to do much good to have a cave full of a lot of food. <laughs> so yeah, I, I, it's just a part of, a, of our movement that it seems a little odd to me. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So back to the book, I mean, what would you say would be the thing that you'd love for people to take away from it? Best figures I've heard is that there are between 90 and 100 million people who still self-identify as evangelicals. They'll check off that box. That's, uh, that's almost a third of America. That's a, that's a chunk of people. And a lot of good has come out of that. And there are so many people grew up in, uh, you know, going to Young Life Clubs or Youth for Christ or Campus Crusade and going to summer camps, maybe, maybe Christian colleges. All of that kind of sprouted after World War II in the 1950s and 60s. And I was growing up right in the middle of all that. I was in a more extreme version, not a healthy version at all. But it's, a, it's kind of a shared American experience of a lot of us. And I, I wanted to 
capture what that was like. Uh, not in a propagandistic way, but just to say, this is what happened. And I've read uh, various people have done that for Orthodox Jews. They've done it for Catholics. But I hadn't really seen a book, uh, not an analysis, but a, a fictional, not a, not a fictional, but a memoir kind of retelling of what that movement was like. And then, okay, 100 million people identify us evangelicals, there are probably 25 to 30 million who would characterize themselves as ex-evangelicals or yes. ex-evangelicals. Yes. And those are people who still have some wistful memories of summer camp and some of those things, but man, they ran into these the angry part of the church, mad at gays people, gay people, or mad at science, or, you know, the anti- people who are anti the rest of the culture around them. And uh, they don't know how to put that together. So they just kind of remove themselves from the church. Those are the people I'd really like to reach. Hmm. I know that people who have read my books may want to know some of the reasons behind them. And that's fine. But my, my, really, my goal in writing the book is to reach that borderland group <laughs> of hmm. people who... Uh, maybe I had a bad church experience. I've been around a lot of these people and they uh, tell me their story about how terrible the church is. And I just kind of laugh and say, oh, it's, it's a lot worse than that. Let me tell you my church story. And they're kind of shocked. I thought you were a Christian writer. <laughs> well, I am. Let me tell you, let me tell you why, you know? And, <laughs> and I, I want to sound a note of hope that uh, don't, don't throw out God because of the church. Don't blame yeah, God for yeah, the church. Yeah. And to to forfeit the possibility of a connection with the creator of the universe because of some funny thing that happened in a church when you were 13 years old, that's a bad trade. And, and I, I had those things happen and I did survive them and I'm glad I did. And I've been kind of clawing my way back ever since. And those really the people most close to my heart in reaching this, them through this book. Well, good for you, good for you, I hope it does. Um, now you had some other books came out recently too. The one about John Donne and right. um, the, the another one with uh, Paul Brand, mm -hmm. right? Um, so, but looking forward, uh, is there anything coming out anytime soon that you can talk about, <laughs> or or not? Is it too early? It is too early. Yeah, I've got some <laughs> ideas, but I just decided, you know, I've got to wait until this memoir thing is done completely. I've been doing a lot of podcasts and. Uh, just kind of clean up stuff after you finish a big project like that. So I haven't really decided on my next project. I'm going to write a book about writing, Brian. Wow, there you things go. Things I've learned about writing over the years. So I'll talk to you about that sometime. Certainly. That'd be great. <laughs> well, Philip, you know, congratulations on this new book and getting it done. And, and it's, it's a masterpiece. It's like, as we talked about, it had to be challenging to do. But boy, did you pull it off well. And uh, mm. I really think it's going to, be of interest to a pretty wide audience, actually, mm. you know, beyond just the ones that you were describing a moment ago, just because of the storytelling alone, mm. you know, um, and I, I think will, you know, really fascinate people. So, so thank you very much for that. Absolutely, Brian. Um, it's been a long haul, but it's done. And it's we're done. talking just the day after the book launch. So the baby's out there and we'll see if people say, that's a nice baby or that's a pretty ugly baby. We'll find out. <laughs> so I assume the best place for people to go is philippiancy.com to find out about it. Right. Yeah. We have a whole page. Um, if, if you look under books, there's a banner for books and then um, just click on where the light fell. That is actually a title that comes from a quote from St. Augustine who said, I could not look at the sun directly but I could look at where the light fell, the rays mm. of the sun. Mm. And that's, that's my story. When you read it, you'll figure out what those rays are. Yes. Yes. All right. Well, thanks again, Philip and best wishes with the rest of the launch. My pleasure. Always good to talk to you, Brian.